So thanks everybody for joining us for this very important, very timely, I would dare say historic webinar hosted by the Center for Governance and Public Policy um, at uh, Griffith University. Um, my name's AJ Brown. I'm a pro professor of public policy and law in the School of Government and in International Relations at Griffith. And it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on Australia's National Anti-Corruption Commission, a new standard for public integrity, question mark. And we're really looking forward to a rich discussion today about this very historic development as of just last week with the passage of Australia's National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation um, and all that, that that involves. So thank you very, very much for, for joining us. I, before we go any further, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land or lands on which we all meet. I'm actually coming to you from Washington DC where I'm attending the International Anti-Corruption Conference um, at the moment. Um, so I'm actually coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, uh, Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples. Um, normally I come from the land of the Combermere and Bundjalung peoples. So we would very much like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of uh, all of the lands on which we're meeting today and to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and pay our respect to all Aboriginal Indigenous people. Um, so it's for today's webinar, we're really excited to bring you some highly qualified, informed and engaged panellists to talk about this uh, historic reform. Um, and we'll engage in a conversation which we'll, which we'll move on to in just a moment. But, uh, but it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Cathy McGowan, uh, the former member for Indi, uh, a community change activist of, of well-renowned right, right around Australia, uh, a, an expert in sustainable agriculture and in policy, uh, and in rural and regional policy, um, and uh, was certainly, as we will discuss, one of the great advocates for integrity reform while in the federal parliament uh, from 2013 to 2019, um, subsequently succeeded, of course, by uh, Dr. Helen Haynes, MP, as, as the uh, independent member for INDI. Um, also in the conversation will be Gary Sturgis, um, speaking from experience uh, from going back some decades now, uh, originally as the Director General of the New South Wales Government Cabinet Office at the time that the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption was established back in 1988, Australia's first uh, independent commission of the kind. Uh, but more recently, amongst many other academic roles, a professor and now uh, adjunct professor of public service innovation at, at Griffith University, as well as many other roles, including with the Australian New Zealand School of Government, uh, working out of the University of New South Wales. Uh, also joining us is my colleague, Professor Janet Ransley, a professor of criminology and director of the Griffith Criminology Institute, who was a member of our Australian Research Council uh, team looking at Australia's national integrity system during the period of these reforms. Um, and finally, uh, at the end of our discussion, we'll be rejoined by Deborah Stokes, uh, who's a board member and committee chair of Transparency International Australia. Um, previously, a very senior diplomat uh, on behalf of the Australian government as Australia's ambassador in Vienna, including to the United Nations and the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. Um, and also as High Commissioner to Papua New Guinea. Um, and, uh, and it's uh, been a, a partnership that much of our research has been undertaken with Transparency International, particularly Transparency Internet, my colleagues at Transparency International Australia um, that we have engaged in and I hope influenced, I think influenced some of the reforms that we're talking about um, today. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce everybody. Deborah will join us at, towards the end of the conversation. Um, we've got 90 minutes allocated for the conversation and that includes some time for Q&A. So please do um, pop questions into the Q&A function in the question and answer box, not, not uh, the chat function, but into the, into the Q&A function. And if we haven't already answered your question in the course of the conversation, there'll be some time to make sure we answer as many questions as possible before we conclude the conversation. So we might just, uh, in opening up the conversation, um, uh, I just wanted to do a slight recap on how we got to this point before uh, opening the conversation. 
Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, and the um, and I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that this reform, Australia's adoption of a National Anti-Corruption Commission has had quite a long history. It was 15, more than 15, 17 years ago that uh, the team at Griffith and Transparency International Australia first recommended a broad-based National Anti-Corruption Commission for Australia, following on the experience then of several states in adopting commissions like that. And of course, it's taken quite a long time and it's been a much more, uh, much more uh, controversial and high, high profile topic in the last several years, um, particularly since the Australian Labor Party now in government um, first promised to introduce a National Anti-Corruption Commission at the beginning of 2018. As we'll discuss, that, that reform really took on a head of steam with the support of civil society organisations, not just Transparency International, but others, the Australia Institute, um, in the course of that year. And it was really when the um, private members bill that was drafted by Cathy McGowan and her team and advisors uh, at, in late uh, 2018, the National Integrity Commission bill um, was introduced to the federal parliament that uh, that, that really brought the whole federal parliament to a point where it realised that it would need to move ahead with this reform. So we had under the previous government, under the Morrison coalition government, we had uh, proposals that became quite controversial for what was then called a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Um, and uh, we got to the point where in both 2019 uh, and then in 2022, uh, integrity and particularly the, the establishment of a National Anti-Corruption Commission really became a mainstream political issue as part of the federal election campaign. And so with the election of the Albanese Labor government this year, um, uh, we've seen the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, uh, finalise a proposal, introduce a proposal, and last week um, achieve the passage of a proposal through the Parliament for the establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. So. Um, so now it's time to talk about that commission. And if we move off the slides now and come back to our panelists, um, I'd really like to um, throw my first question to uh, Kathy McGowan, if I may, um, which was to really ask Kathy, I mean, that's a little bit of a potted history, but uh, Kathy is somebody who was so pivotally involved in bringing this issue to the forefront of the federal parliamentary and legislative agenda. I wanted to ask you, how, how did this all begin for you? Um, and um, generally for the community, but particularly for you as well. And what do you see as having been the drivers of this reform? So thank you, AJ, and hello, everybody. It's great to be here. And just in the research for today, I have to say it's been a very emotional experience. But the, the, it's always fascinating. What was the pivotal point that actually drove it from a personal perspective? Because I tell you what, in 2018, I was busy. I had a lot on my plate, an election coming up. Um, I decided that I wasn't going to run again as a member for Indi. So we were going through the process of succession planning. Uh, it was a very, very busy time. And I was not looking for more work. I already had private members bills around public transport and drought. But what a thing happened. <laughs> and the thing was that I was at a party in Parliament House one Wednesday night. And it had been, you know, socialising and networking and doing what I did was catching up with people. And one of the journalists from the press gallery came up and he said, Kathy, have you heard the goss? And I looked at him and thought, ah, gosh, no, what's the goss? And you haven't heard about Barnaby. I mean, no, I haven't heard about Barnaby. What's he done now? And the goss said, ah, oh, he's got a, one of his staffers is pregnated or impregnated by him. And I, I looked at him, this journalist, and I thought, I said, you've got to be kidding. How would, how would you know? Where, did, where does all this, how do you know these things? And he said, oh, no, it's around. And I said, but he can't, how, tell me more. He said, no, no, that's enough. So I felt physically sick. <laughs> I felt physically ill about that whole sense of what was going on in Parliament. Anyhow, I went back up to the office and um, I did a little bit of research and I'd always known we didn't have a code of conduct, but I, I thought I would do some work about, well, what were the rules if a member of Parliament is having an affair with a staff member? How does it all get managed? 
And of course, I discovered that there was no code of conduct, there's no rules, um, and people can do whatever they want. And while I'd known it in the background, this, this example just really hit me. So I, I then asked my staff to do some research on a code of conduct. And that's where I started because I actually wasn't thinking about integrity. And what, it, what the research showed was that in the um, Gillard Rudd Gillard years, there had been a code of conduct and a bit of integrity legislation begun by the Greens. And it had got through the House of Representatives. So we unearthed that and we, we looked at the early work. And then we discovered that while it had been passed by the House of Reps, it hadn't got through the Senate. So if you can remember those days of 2018, I was on fairly good terms, in fact, very good terms with Malcolm Turnbull. Um, we worked well together on a lot of issues. So we had regular meetings. And at my next regular meeting, I go and see Malcolm and I say, hey, what do you think about an ICAC or an in 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 integrity? And it had been on my agenda, but not pushing it. And I explained to him the story about the gossip. And he'd also heard that same story. And he looked at me and he said, Kathy, well, uh, and he often did say this, he said, if you can get everybody to agree, um, I'll agree. <laughs> like, oh, come on, that's a big ask. Here am I, the backbencher from Northeast Victoria. But anyhow, because I was so emotionally angst by what I'd heard, I said, okay, I'll give it a go. So for the next three months, my staff and I began the work of talking to all the different factions in Parliament House about what would it take. And and, and it was going really well, really positive. The Greens were saying yes. Um, Labor weren't adverse to it. Uh, Dreyfus was the Attorney General. He was across it all. And Malcolm was open to it. So that was looking good. I'd done the groundwork. And then we got what you all know have happened the end of August 2018. They had the coup. Malcolm lost his job. Uh, Morrison came in and the idea went dead. He was not interested. Well, he told me he, he, if it was going to happen, they would do it. They didn't want a private member's bill. Okay, so that wasn't good enough for me. We'd begun the work. So now that was the background, AJ, but I just want to read you a little bit of um, the speech that I made and you were in Parliament on the day, on the 26th of November, 2018, when I introduced the Private Members Bill, because it gives you a bit of a sense of the enormous amount of work that had gone into it. So I said, the bill does not stand alone. It's on the shoulders of giants. And I present that work today. I acknowledge the Australian Research Council's linkage project scheme and the Strengthening Australia's National Integrity uh, System uh, Priorities Reform, which was led by Transparency in International Australia and Griffith University. And I welcome to Parliament you and Fiona McLeod um, and thank you for the work. I also acknowledge the report of the Senate Select Committee on the National Integrity Commission in 2017, the Australian's Green Bill of the same name, and I have to acknowledge Larissa Waters, she did a magnificent job. And they first introduced their Integrity Commission to Parliament in 2012. And I also acknowledge the work of the Australia Institutes. They set up a National Integrity Committee and did a huge amount of socialising the idea among the community. So that's a little bit of my version of the story. Uh, it was an emotional call to action. Um, everybody eventually got behind it. And I have to say, I was just so proud that when Helen Haynes um, was elected in, in Indi, integrity was her on her agenda. She was going to pursue it. So before even the Teals um, picked it up, it's certainly in uh, Northeast Victoria, it was a major issue. Well, that gives us, give us, gives us some a very rich idea of, of some of those drivers for the legislative agenda as of 2018 and and especially your role in it Kathy and I mean it really specific moments of history and then the finally the achieving the legislation last week uh, sort of a major moment of history or I mean or is it I'll, I'll throw to Gary I mean you've having been responsible for reforms of a similar kind 30 years ago I mean is is this a moment of history and what kind of moment is it for Australia Sorry, AJ. Um, look, it's obviously important that um, we now have a piece of national legislation that this has been acknowledged at national level. Uh, and that's a significant moment, clearly. Beyond that, look, I think it's a kink, and I think there's some really interesting um, developments here that uh, are going to work out a little bit differently, I suspect, to how some of the people have planned it. Um, 
to some extent, and a desirable factor, there is, we'll come on to this a little later on, I know, but um, there is a heightened emphasis, um, but it is, a, it is only a heightened emphasis on corruption prevention. There is something of the clearinghouse model to this, and that's a bit different to what we've seen before um, in some of the jurisdictions, certainly in New South Wales. This um, really isn't the Royal Commission model. It's really taking Royal Commission powers and really um, using a crime commission model, really. I mean, this is um, using the Royal Commission power in order to conduct secret hearings um, most of the time um, with a much more active pursuit of criminal prosecution. So that side of things I think is interesting and I think will have some interesting consequences. And there is a now a very wide definition of corruption that is going to have a whole lot of consequences that people have clearly not thought, thought about very much. Um, it's going to go well beyond any, it's, it's going to go well beyond criminality. Mm. And um, so I, I think there's a, you know, there, there's some, some really interesting dimensions to that. I think there's some really um, unpredictable consequences of this particular form. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think we sort of we're, we're beginning a journey in a, down a slightly different road to the one that we have in the past. Well, we might we might explore that and explore several of those issues um, in the course of the conversation. But in terms of that overall question of the model, um, I guess what what um, the, the interesting question in the adoption of this model, and we've just we've just hinted at it there, is that. Um, we have got a range of different models um, across Australia now for anti-corruption commissions. And it's interesting to think about them on the world stage as well. Um, the, certainly we've got in orig the original model in New South Wales that you introduced, Gary, was, was a standing Royal Commission model. Um, and I guess, uh, and, but there's some contrast here. Um, I guess before, um, and, and we can say that that standing Royal Commission model is also in place to some degree in Queensland and Victoria in particular and in Western Australia. Uh, that's part of the history. And the intention certainly at a federal level was to, was to have a standing, I mean, the, the, the language of all parties was that we're gonna create a body with all of the powers of a Royal Commission. That's a standing Royal Commission type of model. Um, you're suggesting that that's not quite what, what's been created at a federal level, but, but let's explore that a little bit further. But before we do, because, I wanted to just put up um, something to make us think a little bit internationally. If um, we have a look at what's been happening internationally with different countries and their perceptions index, if we could put up a slide, a slide quickly on um, which shows Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index um, currently, Louise or Megan, um, then it's actually worth thinking about the fact that Australia is one of a number of developed countries, and you can see Australia in the blue there, that's quite notorious for its slide on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index over the last decade, but it's not the only country. Um, countries like Canada, the US, um, other developed countries that, that haven't had and don't have a national anti-corruption agency of this kind um, have actually been uh, countries that have been uh, among those that have been suffering something of a slide on the perceptions index, even though we're still very high on that index. Um, and um, so it sort of begs this larger question about the institutional architecture in these, in our different countries for, for uh, how we fight corruption. Um, and traditionally it's been using the criminal law and a law enforcement approach. And that's what many developed countries still rely on, especially at a national government level. Um, but many other countries have, have adopted a, an approach where, they, where they've introduced a specialist national anti-corruption agency, still often though using the criminal law, but, but also potentially more broadly. So it raises this broad question about what's happening internationally with anti-corruption investigation and prevention, um, that it's worth thinking about how, how we compare and what our options are. Um, so if we, we move off that slide and, and back to you, Gary, the, that, that first question about, well, a Royal, standing Royal Commission model, I mean, that is different to what other countries have done in that most countries have been relying on a criminal law enforcement approach. Um, so what, given that, that 
the, back in 1988 in New South Wales with the creation of the Independent Commission Against Corruption in New South Wales, given that, given that that's what you, what you um, adopted there was different to that. It's a standing Royal Commission model. What made you go down that route in 1988 and, and what is distinctive about that model as opposed to a traditional criminal law enforcement model? Yeah, so I mean, I guess the first thing is to, is to contextualise this for those who sort of came in late, as it were. Um, the problem in New South Wales in 1980, in the 1980s, wasn't um, a member of parliament having a completely consensual affair with a, an adult member of, of staff that went on to become a marriage or a permanent relationship. We had um, uh, the prisons minister who went to jail for selling early releases from prison to criminals. And we had a widespread and long-standing um, series of scandals into the into the judicial into the court system, and the and the criminal justice system. Uh, these this was a very serious problem, and we had a government that and a, and a premier, a very strong premier, who partly because I think for political reasons it was an old government and he didn't want more controversy. Um, but partly possibly because he did, just couldn't believe that the problem was as bad as the opposition and the press were asserting, where he just simply either refused to hold inquiries or when he did set up an inquiry, he gave them such narrow terms of reference that there was never any prospect that they were going to get to the bottom. And in some cases, um, he empowered them to go after the whistleblowers uh, and not to actually address the, the, the core allegation. So a much, uh, a very serious situation. And there were a number of reasons why the Royal Commission model attracted itself. Firstly, the police had historically shown either an inability or an unwillingness to go after these matters um, and offering extraordinarily naive, naive explanations as to why they hadn't been able to probe dark corners. And so there really wasn't a lot of confidence in the New South Wales police doing that. Um, and a great deal of corruption in the New South Wales police at the time didn't help. But the next point is that, you know, as I looked at the history of corruption preventions going back, you know, hundreds of years, corruption is essentially a crime of the powerful. It's a crime of people who've got, usually got enough money to hire lawyer, good lawyers. Um, and it's a, it's a history of um, the, the, the people about whom the allegations were made almost always getting away with it. Criminal prosecutions for corruption were rare. And as I say, I think that's because of the nature of the offence. So that sort of lent itself to, um, to some other route. And the Royal Commission historically has been used to go into problems where there is a systemic, you know, there's a systemic aspect to what you're trying to look at and you're wanting to expose it, um, give immunities to people, compel them to give evidence, but give them, give them um, immunity if they are required to self-incriminate in order to, uh, you know, avoid the obvious, um, problem of, of sending people to jail over evidence they were forced to give against themselves. So that it, it was deliberately designed to um, arrive at findings about people and problems where the criminal law would have difficulty going. It was an old model. Um, it's a well-known model. Uh, we have a body of law and practice that we're familiar with it. I went to uh, with the then Attorney General to Hong Kong and looked at the Hong Kong ICAC, which is a more secretive body, or was a more secretive body with just phenomenal powers, um, and quite surprising to see a body with those kind of powers well beyond a Royal Commission in a, in a system of government which, is, which was at that time under the, the administration of the British. So it was quite a, a, you know, quite a worrying body. Um, so for all of those reasons, the... Um, the, the Royal Commission model, you know, it was something we we're familiar with and it was something that could go in and look at bigger problems than simply one that would normally uh, come before the criminal law and have available to it a range of tools that, that police officers didn't have. 
So that um, I think really, I guess, uh, opens up the question of what the scope of the jurisdiction of this new agency is, because we're clearly talking here about, and you said it yourself, Gary, we're talking about more than simply criminal offences. We're talking about areas where there's wrongdoing that is not necessarily criminal, but which could be corrupt. Um, uh, or carry such high risk of, of criminal corruption that it's clearly needs to be addressed and, and corrected. And that may begin with personal matters or it, but it, or it may deal, be dealing with public resources or um, almost any kind of issue. So I think, I mean, we can safely say that it's a distinctive feature of, of other Australian anti-corruption commissions um, and now this, this new model that it's not just limited to um, to criminal offences, but I might I might flick to you, Janet, to just explain, you know, what is the jurisdiction of this body? What is the scope of this body, and um, and uh, how should we understand it in terms of what what sort of role it plays in our system? Thanks, AJ. Thanks for that. And um, I I agree with you, and um, to a certain extent with some of the things that Gary has said as well. And that in some respects, this is more of the same for those of us that are familiar with. Um, anti-corruption um, commissions in other states and territories which have now a 30-year history across Australia and which is I think distinctively Australian when you compare the way that we approach this issue to um, most other places internationally but there are a couple of interesting quirks if you like in in this act uh, the object of the act is to deal with serious or systemic corrupt conduct so immediately that tells us that there, there should be a, a pointy end focus um, with the activities of, of the um, commission. There's a definition of corrupt conduct, which has a lot of similarities in terms of the examples that are given um, with the um, definitions in states and territories, things like um, uh, conduct that affects the impartial exercise of performance of an official's powers, um, the uh, breach of public trust, abuse of office, those, those kinds of familiar concepts on which we now have quite a, a decent jurisprudence. Uh, there's a very clear, um, as you say, acknowledgement that this can be both criminal and non-criminal conduct, which again, we see in, in some of the states, certainly in Queensland, New South Wales, there is no requirement that the conduct in order to um, attract the attention of the commission constitute a criminal offence. But what is required in, in um, as far as I know, every other jurisdiction is a second arm of that definition of corrupt conduct, which is not just about those that the abuse of trust or the misuse of office, but as the second limb is that the conduct would, would be an offence, either criminal or a disciplinary breach. So for example, if I look at the Queensland legislation, it says that in order to um, enliven the jurisdiction, of the commission, it has to be either, if proved, either a criminal offence or a disciplinary breach justifying termination of employment. Um, and that's there's a very similar sort of form of words um, in New South Wales for the ICAG. So what we're seeing then is a second limb to the requirement, which is not present in the, in the new Commonwealth legislation. So that's a possibly broader definition. Um, obviously it's early days, but it's a possibly broader definition of corruption than that which we've become accustomed to in, in the states and territories. And I think that will become a, a lot clearer as, as we go on and as the commission starts its work and as we get to see some of the examples um, coming out. I do think that the other distinctive feature about the federal body will be the opportunity to provide national leadership to provide some cohesion and integration across some of the different practices that are occurring in, in some of the states and territories, as we found out in our in our project, and to start um, you know developing um, that national anti-corruption plan that is uh, actually a requirement um, under the UN Convention Against Corruption. So that that makes it really interesting because I think what that confirms is that at a Commonwealth level now, at least in terms of the scope. The Standing Royal Commission sort of function is there, um, in that it's it's um, if anything a, a more flexible. I think we've described it as a more flexible um, uh, definition of corruption that's sort of more first principles based. Well, you've you've pointed out that it does have the overall filter that the Commission can receive 
um, any kind of corruption allegation, but it can only actually investigate uh, allegations or matters that it assesses as being either serious or systemic. Um, so there's a, but it's a subjective um, serious or systemic filter for the National Commission now, as opposed to having that supposedly perhaps more objective test of a criminal offence or a disciplinary offence. So, so that, that does um, put us in a new ballpark in terms of the potential flexibility, um, the stretch, if you like. And I think Gary's already alluded to some of that as well. Um, but if we move on to the other key element, I guess, which is the nature of the powers and the roles of the way the Commission would operate in terms of that investigative jurisdiction, I guess that comes us back to the other key, key um, question um, that goes with the Royal Commission model that we're talking about and the Standing Royal Commission idea, which is the way that powers are exercised, particularly powers to compel people to give evidence and, they, and either in, in private hearings or examinations or in public hearings, which are obviously very familiar to us from, from Royal Commissions. So it's interesting there. I think this gets us back to, to your point, Gary, about is this a Royal Commission model or is this a more a crime commission model? Um, and we might just um, put up the next slide and maybe, Gary, you can, can uh, while, we, while people have a look at uh, having a look at this particular slide, Louise or uh, Megan, if we could have this one. Thank you very much. Um, what, what we did in the course of the debate and the research over um, that, that, that helped input into this model was actually compare the different range of powers that existing anti-corruption bodies have in Australia to hold public hearings, in particular, this, this, the classic standing Royal Commission model of an of a anti-corruption commission. And you can access this uh, graphic by going to the Transparency International Australia website. You don't have to fully absorb it here now. Um, but what we, um, you know, what we observed was that there was a fair amount of difference between, at a state level, which is below the line here, um, between the agencies that have got very wide um, pub power, uh, power discussions as to when they hold public hearings for investigative purposes in anti-corruption matters. Um, with, with uh, states like New South, territories like New South Wales and the ACT towards down the right hand end. Um, and then at the opposite end of the spectrum down the left hand end, uh, a classic crime commission model in South Australia with no public hearing roles, simply a role of investigating criminal offences and putting them before the courts, but no, no public hearings. And then, uh, and then Victoria sitting somewhere in between um, and what we have above the line here is, you can see the, lo the location of the proposed now past Albanese government model, which is the National Anti-Corruption Commission that we've been talking about, which is down towards the left-hand end of the spectrum um, because it involves not only a range of discretions as to when the public hearing would be in the, in the public interest, but also a whole range of tests to, to say when evidence can simply not be given in public at all. Um, a range of constraints that, that would then mitigate in favour of holding private hearings. There's been this whole other debate about uh, having a test which has been inserted in the legislation that public hearings could only be held in exceptional circumstances, which became controversial and survived in the final bill last week, despite that, co that controversy. And that's the yellow dot on this graphic. Um, so, um, so we do have, we have landed in a new location, I guess, Gary, is that, is that the bottom line of, of what, how, how you've assessed this? Um, and does it mean that we've got a Royal Commission model or, or not? So you might just want to expand on the point you were making before as to where you assess us as, as having landed on this spectrum of, of how public hearings feature in the role of this type of commission. Yeah, I, I think there's something very disturbing about this. Um, and I've been, it's a point I've been making in lectures uh, and, and, and articles for some time. We had no difficulty in this country having an inquiry into drug trafficking and naming farm, Italian farmers in the Riverina as mafia drug growers um, using the Royal Commission power. We had no difficulty having a Royal Commission into the finance industry and naming and shaming financial figures. We had no difficulty in going after institutional responses to sexual abuse of children and naming and shaming figures in the churches and other institutions. No problems doing that at all. Public hearings, 
uh, using the Royal Commission model, but suddenly for politicians and public servants, we've got a, a model where we're going to be substantially uh, in camera. It's going to be substantially in, in secret. And I'd like to, I mean, you know, I, I accept that there are consequences of using that model, but we have created a special model for politicians, different from the model that apply to, you know, figures in the church and figures in the in the in the finance industry. And we've we've not had that, we've not had a discussion about that. Why is it that we've got a special set of rules for them? And so what we've got is a model that is now overwhelmingly private. And that's going to work differently. I think there's some really interesting questions that have got to be asked about how it is going to work. Why is this model superior when somebody can be required to give evidence in confidence and incriminate themselves um, and it isn't going to wind up in a, in a criminal prosecution, presumably very often, because, um, because if they've been forced to incriminate themselves, um, then you can't use ev that evidence against them. So, you know, this is a this is an odd odd beast, um, and we've had some controversy in recent years about the Crime Commission model and the way that those powers have been used. So, you know, I think there's some really interesting questions to be asked about um, this this essentially Crime Commission model that um, that that the uh, federal parliament has arrived at. So we might, uh, I might get Janet's view on this as well, and we can probably move off this slide now. But as I said, people can access it by looking up the Transparency International Australia website and uh, and finding our submission to the Joint Select, Select Committee that examined this legislation that passed last week. But but the I guess the key the, the, this key question that Gary's thrown to us is this: the Standing Royal Commission model that we thought that most uh, jurisdictions in Australia we're becoming familiar with um, uh, or is it something so significantly narrower that that we describe it as being a different model I guess that it, it, to some degree hinges around um, this exceptional circumstances test that that um, is in legislation in Victoria has been for about a decade um, the Victorian Independent Broad-Based Anti-Corruption Commission has wrestled with having this test um, of it of it having to be satisfied that there are exceptional circumstances before a hearing uh, before evidence would be taken in a public hearing as opposed to a, a private hearing or just normal investigations and so that's clearly where this exceptional circumstances test in the federal legislation has come from and I guess the question is um, whether the presence of that test um, is uh, problematic or not um, in terms of whether we've ended up with a commission that can accurately be described as having the proper role and powers of a standing royal commission, which is really what what all the policymakers have said it it should be. So, how do you interpret, you know, the the risk or the extent of that particular problem uh, in terms of this legislation? Well, the simple answer to that question is I've got no idea because I don't know how that exceptional circumstances um, requirement is going to be applied or interpreted, although I do suspect that it will be a dampener. I mean, these the, the, more, the more of these requirements that you add into legislation, the, the more of a dampening effect it has so that, um, you know, no new commission wants to um, have its actions immediately challenged in, in court proceedings and particularly to have um, a challenge upheld. So I think it will inspire a, an element of caution that might, might not otherwise have been there. But then the other question, I think, is, and again, this was prompted by something that, that Gary said, is to think about what is the value of public hearings? What, why do we regard public hearings as so critical to the success of commissions of inquiry or these standing commissions? Um, and does it really matter if, if we're not having um, hearings in public? And that comes down to that difference between a crime commission, which is essentially a law enforcement body, which is aiming to de detect, uncover, and lead to prosecution of, of offences, usually serious, significantly serious offences, but it's essentially a law enforcement body, and a traditional commission of inquiry, which has such a much broader range of purposes, which is looking at policy, looking at policy failure, looking at implementation failure, looking at the conduct of individuals as well, but it's, it's a much smaller, 
part and more and more increasingly over the last 20 years, we've seen commissions of inquiry also have significant research bases where they're looking at empirical evidence, where they're, where they're working in collaboration with others to give a wholly rounded picture of, of, of an issue rather than something that's all about is there, is there um, enough evidence here to satisfy a, a burden of proof to prove, to prove guilt? Um, and I think anything that, and, and that's where public hearings have been of value in traditional commissions of inquiry in opening up these issues, um, in bringing forth a, a diversity of opinions rather than um, you know, just those opinions represented in parliament or in, in vocal stakeholders, but allowing a much broader input. I think it's a very democratizing um, aspect of commissions of inquiry, um, particularly again in, in more modern times where there's been much more openness to having a broad range of submissions and a broad, broad range of witnesses appear rather than just the usual suspects. Um, and I think it's, for me, that's, that's the big concern about anything that dampens the use of public hearings in, in the NAC. So I might might get your view, Cathy. I mean, the clearly this has been a very iconic issue in the public domain. This question of how transparent, how how much public hearings are used. We know that the justification of this exceptional circumstances test has been really twofold. One is that in Victoria it hasn't really got in the way of the Victorian Commission being able to hold public examinations. Um, although the Victorian Commission has said that the test is is cumbersome and unhelpful and, and really shouldn't, shouldn't be used or adopted and shouldn't have been copied by the Commonwealth. Um, uh, but the second is that the, the statistically, um, the existing anti-corruption bodies, including the New South Wales ones and the ones that have more free and open public hearing powers, um, still only use them relatively sparingly compared to the amount of investigative work that does go on in a normal fashion privately and using private hearings. So public hearings are the exception, you know, from the rule in terms of the, the, the number of hearings and investigations that go on. Um, but that's obviously different to a, a test of having, having to have exceptional circumstances before you can have a public hearing. Um, so what's your take on how big a problem this is, particularly in terms of public perception of, of whether the Commission will be able to do the job that people expect it to do? So uh, I've got a couple of comments on this. One is I just want to talk about the pragmatics of politics. So the reason why it's in there, I think, the, 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 again, the, 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 the talk is that to get it, Anthony Albanese wanted everybody to vote for it. And so that was the price he paid to get the opposition on side. So it was a pragmatic um, political activity. So it's not there by, I don't think it's there by design and I don't think it's there by good practice. I think it's there because it was a, a compromise. So that's that's my sense of it. Um, and I think the, the all the crossbench and particularly the new ones got elected in May 22 all voted for it not to be there. They all wanted to go back to a much better model. So clearly it was, it was it's controversial. And it was a compromise, I think. So having said that, um, Janet, I really like what you've just said. It's about how the skill of the, um, the body when it exists, how it's going to work. Um, because I, I think they're having, having saying it's undesirable, really, ideally, it's nothing to say you can't make it work. Because as we've just been saying, and you just said, AJ, that um, the normal practice is these things are in private. It's only occasionally you get the um, the Gladys big big fuss in New South Wales. So hope, hopefully the skill of the, the people who win these positions can actually combine public need to know, um, the opportunity to educate the public, um, and certainly the fact that this is a huge agenda for people like corruption. We know it's there. So you can't keep it all under the rug. You've actually got to bring it out. So I, I hope that there will be some common sense and I hope the legal system will be able to, um, to, to do what it needs to be doing. And, and the final thing I want to say, I live in Victoria and I've been, I've been watching the IBAC here and it is, a, it is a great disappointment to me that we don't have more information about the inquiries and we only get it on the edge, um, occasionally media, 
Um, and we, we never get the full story about what's going on. And we're not able to make, or rarely, able to make our own decisions. So I, I think as a community, we are um, disenfranchised by that model. And, and when the, the, high, the commissioner in Victoria gave that advice to the Commonwealth, I was going, here, here, it would have been much better if it wasn't inserted. So there, that's my sense of the practicalities versus the reality, I suppose, of politics. AJ, I think if I can add, there's a morality play element to the public hearing. And I know that that can be very difficult for the people going through the experience, but the Royal Commission model, you know, if you think about the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse and the one end of the financial system, um, and I think in New South Wales, the OBEAD and the inquiry into OBEAD, and of course the OBEAD one has led on to two successful criminal prosecutions with the third one um, about to commence. You know, it was interesting in, 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 in the OBEAD case, people were talking about what was happening in, in ICAC um, the, the previous day over coffee in the morning. Mm. And I, you know, I think Cathy's point about the disappointment of things being you know, not being more, more public. One of the benefits of, of, of these things being played out in public is, is that we as a community observe, in some cases, things that are not obviously corrupt, or in other cases, things that were are outrageously so, but going, going on secretly and none of us had any idea. And we develop, as a community, we, de we sh reshape and develop our view about the rightness and wrongness of things. And I think that's a healthy process. Now, obviously there are, you know, there, there have been abuses and there is a need to protect witnesses um, and, and people, and, and to be very clear about people who are found not to have engaged in corrupt conduct. And I think there's been places where there has not been sufficient care, but there's just a lot of value about um, from this broader, from public hearings and these wider, um, as Janet was saying, the, this sort of wider contextual discussion about what's going on here and about how we as a society and how about how government should should respond to specific problems. Mm. So I think, um, I mean, my my own assessment would be that that we are still talking about a body that that can function as a standing royal commission because the test as to whether there are sufficiently exceptional circumstances or just any exceptional circumstances. Um, that would enable a public hearing to be held in the public interest um, is one that is there for the commission. It's not, doesn't have any other definition and threshold and going on what's in second reading speeches and explanatory memoranda. Um, uh, the context of it is that, is that um, uh, there's um, sort of no, this should really impose no specific limit on the ability of the commission to be able to hold public hearings. It's just a very general concept um, that has to be satisfied. Um, it's not neat, but it's not necessarily going to be a legal problem. Um, what's new about this model is that there are, there, have, there are a whole lot of new rules about the types of evidence that can't be used in a public hearing that do relate to protecting the traditional criminal investigation process, not jeopardizing trials, um, ensuring that the welfare of witnesses, their mental health or their reputation or whatever is considered um, in a variety of ways. So some of that is new in terms of codification of, of the way in which public hearings can be used. Um, and I guess the test will be whether that means that the that sort of standing Royal Commission effect and model that, that everybody's been talking about, whether that gets prevented or frustrated I guess I'm guessing, um, Gary, that you think that it might be by this degree. Oh, I, oh you can count on it. Rules. Count on it. Somebody's going to turn up with 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 statements from three psychiatrists saying that they are deeply distressed and and that their mental health is compromised. Um, look, it's a terrible thing that guilt causes some people to either take their lives or attempt to. Um, and and I guess in some cases it would appear the mere stress of that um, um, and indeed you know there's there's a number of cases of people who are under corruption investigation who developed cancer or had heart attacks as a result you can see this arose from the sustained stress that's unfortunate 
but boy, if you start to bend the criminal justice system based upon the fact that people suffer terrible stress, um, we need to take it into account. But if we allow that to, to be a, a, a real tripwire and, and, and it works here, you know, as a, as a very strong tripwire, it seems to me, people are going to turn up with multiple, you know, doc documents mm. from multiple psychiatrists saying this person's at risk. And um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, a lot of places where uh, inquiries will be threaded. I mean, also excluding, you know, cabinet matters that are cabinet in confidence. We know from the freedom of information laws for decades that has been used as a giant loophole. There are whole mm. systems within government created to push things through the, the cabinet route. And th th that is going to be another place where the system will attempt to block and prevent scrutiny because, you know, because of a blanket, um, a, a rather unfortunate blank, blanket tripwire around that. So mm. I, I really do worry about, about the mm -hmm. number of tripwires they put in there. Mm -hmm. So that's one area where where we know we need to watch how this commission actually plays out in practice to see what's going to going to be effective or not. Coming back to you, Cathy, in terms of the politics, just before we move off this public hearings issue, I mean, one of our arguments was that this exceptional circumstances test for public hearings was it may not be a, it may or may not be a legal problem, but do we think that it could be a political problem down the track that there could be a parliament or a particular party or a government in power that says, hang on a minute, that's not my, uh, this is not my idea of exceptional circumstances. This is, the commission's out of control because it's assessed this, the, these circumstances to be ex sufficiently exceptional to justify a public hearing, but, but you know, I don't think so. Um, has it got that risk for down the track? That's such a hard question uh, to, to know. Um, because, because truly it, did, it was a political issue at the election and it was an election winning issue in a large number of seats. So people do care about it. Like it, it, it's, it's known about and it's, it, will people hold on to that, um, that, that, um, that, that emotion, I suppose, given the change of government? Because part of that sense that things were really bad was from the last government and the experience that people had that, you know, the car parks in Melbourne, for example, things were just not working out well. So people had an experience of really bad behaviour. So how long does it stay in the public memory, I think, is the um, the issue. And then, so if we have, a, as some people are predicting, three terms of an Albanese-type government, and it's a good government and things are done well, um, people's memory of what it was like might lessen. So I, I don't know, it's it's too far away to be able to, to say, but... I think a wise government would pay attention to it because it, it, in the short term, it wouldn't take a lot to reignite that, that very strong sense of um, um, political anger that people were being taken, taken down a way they didn't want to go. And it was about integrity. So I think if this government showed a weakness in that regard, it wouldn't take much to pick it up. But I think in the longer term, 10, 15 years out, it might be a very different set of circumstances. So it's going to be, people are going to need to be vigilant um, and, um, and for vigilance to be maintained on these issues. And we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out in practice, I guess, to see whether those public expectations, political expectations and the performance of the legislation line up. Um, we might move on to another issue, which is very central to um, to any anti-corruption commission um, and to this model, which is uh, the corruption prevention side of, of uh, the activity of an agency like this. Most of what we've been talking about so far relates to corruption investigations, identifying corruption issues and corrupt uh, corruption, potential corruption cases and when these sorts of powers would be brought to bear on investigating them. But, but um, I think Gary alluded to prevention right from the word go, and the, and some of the some of what you've talked about is about the preventive effects, the the cultural effects, the educative effects um, on on the whole body politic and on, on on public administration about how some of these cases play out in the public domain. But I guess what you mentioned prevention right at the beginning as being potentially a distinctively um, advantageous 
part of this particular model, but I might ask Janet, um, since this is an area of your specialty, um, what's, what, what if anything is distinctive or new about this new National Commission from a corruption prevention point of view? Thanks, AJ. And it's, I mean, it's really great to see prevention feature so, so strongly in the, in the legislation. That's not particularly distinctive because most of the um, state and territory agencies also do have a function for, um, for prevention. Um, the, the objects of the Act clearly um, include um, a focus on prevention and a focus, a separate focus on education. I think that's interesting because often those two things are conf conflated. And as a, as a person um, who, who looks at prevention, um, I know that prevention and education uh, have some overlap but aren't, aren't necessarily the same thing, but often it's education, which is talked about in terms of prevention and so much more that can be done. I think the other interesting thing about this legislation is part nine of the Act, which enables the um, commissioner of his or her own initiative to conduct a public inquiry. So, um, distinct from the public hearings, distinct from investigations, a, um, a separate form of public inquiry, which in my mind is actually more akin to a, a traditional commission of inquiry into risks and vulnerabilities for corruption and corruption um, measures, corruption prevention measures and, and how these risks and vulnerabilities can be overcome. I think that will be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and the, the report the, the, a report has to be prepared and has to be tabled um, if, if the inquiry has held any public hearings. So I think what we've got here is a really good framework, but the test will be in how that's implemented and how it's fleshed out. Uh, who's going to lead this work? What, what's the staffing mix going to be? Are we going to see a, uh, a predominance of investigators and particularly police or former police brought in because of their skills in investigation? But they're very narrow on the whole. Um, apologies for offending any police watching, but they're, they're narrow focus on law enforcement and on detecting criminal conduct. Because when we're talking about prevention of corruption, we need to have a much broader view about, um, about areas of grey corruption, which might not necessarily be criminal offences, and also some of the um, risks and vulnerabilities that can lead to, um, to corruption occurring in, in the future. So we need, um, we need to see how this plays out. Uh, we need um, a strong focus on what's effective in corruption prevention. And I'll come back to this issue of education. Education is one component of corruption prevention, but there are a whole range of other tools in that toolbox. We need to make sure that we don't just go down the education route because we're familiar with it. It seems relatively um, easy to do. Um, one of the issues that we've seen with prevention in some of the state and territory bodies is um, very small resourcing, very small staff numbers, very small budgets compared to the investigative arm. You know, if we're serious about prevention, we actually need to make sure that we resource it separately to, to investigation and that we don't just see prevention as something that is a comment at the end of an investigation report, oh, this could possibly have been prevented if we'd done X. What we need is a prevention plan, an overall comprehensive prevention plan that identifies vulnerabilities, identifies ways of, um, of addressing those vulnerabilities and actually being proactive rather than reacting after the event. We have the framework that would permit that. I think the legislation absolutely permits that, but a lot of it will come down to implementation, to staffing, to resourcing, um, and to a focus on an evidence base for what's effective in these areas. And that requires tackling with that, tackling that really hard issue of how do we measure outcomes for preventing, for preventing corruption? How do we measure what we've stopped from happening? And that, you know, that's a hard issue. It's been tackled in other domains. It's certainly been tackled in crime. It's been tackled in um, corporate regulation. So there are other ways to do this. But a focus on investigations and simply following on from investigations is what needs to be avoided. So overall, good, good framework, good bones, but we need to flesh it out and see how it gets fleshed out. So, in, in, I mean, Gary, I might ask you, in terms of the model, I mean, it, it's like the Standing Royal Commission model on this, on the prevention side is, has been well institutionalised here. Um, in, in parallel to the investigation, which is quite 
uh, unusual. I mean, we haven't seen that before in our own state or territory legislation, and nor have we seen it internationally. I think in terms of of any you know agencies tend to be either you know all investigation, law enforcement, um, or um, they tend to be sort of just prevention. That's the an education. That's sort of the bulk of what they do. Um, so how do you, uh, I mean, how, how do you see this playing out or how should it play out in terms of the, the potential role that this could play? Yeah, look, I mean, that's actually one of the very few things we borrowed from the Hong Kong ICAC. They were doing some very good um, education work, very clever education work back 40 years ago. Um, and they did have a corruption prevention function. Um, this, this, I think, is a significant step forward by placing a lot more emphasis. On, you know, it, it's, it's, much, it's a much stronger element of the, of the legislation and, uh, and all of that's healthy. Um, New South Wales, if you look at its history, um, early on the corruption prevention people tended to be small in number and they really were quite mm, legalistic in their approach. And then they brought in uh, somebody with a much more systemic approach uh, to corruption prevention. And I think, you know, it's very easy to sort of, it, it, to go and recommend a whole lot more laws um, uh, to, as your solution uh, and, and, and uh, checking procedures and all of that uh, makes you feel warm and can sort of provide you with um, some insurance against embarrassment later on. I, I think, you know, we, walk, we sort of really need, and New South Wales ICAC was doing this quite well and they've continued that tradition after that particular person left. But I think, you know, focusing on systems and processes and thinking through better design as a way of, of um, uh, making corruption more difficult um, is, 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 is important. And obviously, I mean, on the educational side, again, early on, and they really haven't continued this to the same extent, but early on, I know Tembi was very conscious that with such a high immigrant population, you get people who come from other countries who simply didn't know that you didn't have to pay the person um, who was doing your driving test, right? They were coming from a country where that was um, much more routine. And, uh, you know, there's a really important work to be done in, um, in, in uh, people who come from a different uh, national and cultural background about the way things, the way things ought to work here. And you, you know, you shouldn't be paying someone in, in order to facilitate um, getting a driver's license or whatever it is. So there's, um, you know, I think a lot more clever work uh, can be done on the education side um, mm. as well. So no, no, I, I, I think the greater emphasis here is, um, is, is, is important and a step forward. I have to say, you know, when I was discussing this with Nick Greiner, we really imagined that after 10 years, the overwhelming bulk of the, of the New South Wales ICAC work would be corruption uh, prevention and education, that the need for ongoing investigation would have substantially atrophied. And, and of course, uh, subsequent events have proved that that hasn't been the case. People seem just not to learn. Um, so uh, you, you've, got to keep, you've got to keep both sides of this going. Mm -hmm. Cathy, <coughs> I could see you nodding there. I mean, prevention was and, and protecting the protecting what was good about public administration and political decision making into the future and making, you know, reinforcing that as the norm rather than the exception was always a big focus of of uh, what you were talking about in 2018. So how do you see the outcome now in terms of of that that bal particular balance? Mm. Uh, I must have been, I'm really enjoying this conversation. So thank you, everybody, and Gary, for your insights. So Helen and my bill, we were looking for an integrity commission, not an anti-corruption. We really wanted it to be on the better part, the better part of us, our being our best selves and creating a society where that was the norm. And we that didn't didn't work. It, it went the other way. So I, and I'm also fascinated by what you're talking about in Hong Kong. And I, I'm just wondering what's happening to those people there now with all that Hong Kong work. I'm just going to be really sad to, um, well, important, I suppose, to understand there. But yeah, I've got nothing to add on that. Just it's it's really, anti-corruption is a really different thing from integrity. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I work in the integrity space. 
and setting standards for integrity, which is a code of practice. And I know we're going to talk about the whistleblower and I know we're going to talk about other ideas, but I think that whole idea of having an understanding of what a, a nation that's got integrity, politicians that's got integrity, public servants that have integrity, what it looks like. Is a, is a much is a place where I want to work. And so just mm. using the example of the driver's license there, um, Gary, really creating a, an environment where the the people who are doing the tests create the sense of a service. We're here at your service. And we're here because we want people to be safe on roads as opposed to the other, other approach. So I think we've got a long, long, long way to go there. But I'm just going to make my little bit there. The work that I'm currently doing now is what with, with this um, we've called it the Community Independence Project. And we had a, a Zoom last night, 150 people on board, talking about putting community at the centre of politics. And the belief is that if you put community at the centre of politics, then you're going to get better legislation and better governance because the community will have an understanding of it. Currently, with parties at the centre of politics, something else happens altogether. So I'm loving the discussion that the community independents are having about how do we actually bring into existence and reinforce this idea that it's the electorate that holds the MP to account <laughs> and then the M MP does what the um, community want and the community is informed and empowered and enabled to actually hold their MP to account. So it seems to me um, um, I, I want to be live in that world rather than imposing punishment from the top down, the systems, um, actually the integrity that's designed into a democracy which is every vote counts, can actually be used in that way. So if people are interested, um, communityindependence.com.au uh, is where that discussion's happening and people are now getting organised for the next federal election. Um, a number of community independents will be running and that's certainly what they're thinking about. How do, how do we, we co-design a system where integrity and being your best self is at the centre of everything you do? Mm. Well, that's actually a good point in which to segue to another issue with the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which was about the relationship between the commission and the people, this commission and the people and the, com the community via the parliament, um, which really goes to the question about the independence of the commission and whether in fact it's there to serve the government of the day or whether it's there to serve the parliament or the people through the parliament. Um, so this is a this is a body that's been created, you know, in that landscape you were just describing, Kathy, to be to, to work on behalf of the people to hopefully do some prevention and some integrity building as well. Um, but it's certainly clearly to do the anti-corruption investigation. Um, but the, the particular issue that I'm getting at here is actually who um, how independent is the commission from the government of the day and can it really serve the whole of the community by serving the whole of the parliament the, i mean and i guess that uh, th this is um another question that's really important to think about is uh, about this outcome there was a big debate at the end of the day in the creation of this bill about who appoints the commissioner um and the um the bill is structured so that like with all with our state commissions as a parliamentary committee, which which does have to represent broadly the parliament. It has to include at least two two members who aren't members of either the government or the opposition, for example, amongst the twelve people who are on the parliamentary committee that oversights the um, the commission. Um, so that's a new that's a new thing, uh, and I think that partly reflects the role that independents and the crossbenchers have played. In the history of this and the role that we you know we expect them to continue to play in the federal parliament um but the the controversy in this bill at the last minute was okay uh that committee has to approve the recommendation of the government as to who to appoint to the commissioner but but under the the the, the numbers on the committee means that the government with a casting vote could itself um make that decision prevail in in the favor of its recommendation over the opposition of the non-government members of the committee and that became quite controversial um, with various proposals to to make it a special majority or a super majority or even just a sim pure total simple majority so that it wasn't just the government of the day that that um on the committee that could carry the votes to recommend approval of the proposed appointment by the government so that's just one example i guess of where um this commission's landed where 
this this question about its independence is is going to remain live how how independent do we think it it's going to be and what are the lessons from that um i might come back to you in a minute minute kathy but i might ask gary what he thinks of the outcome and and janet in terms of the independence of the commission um look you know these things ought to be as with auditors general uh creatures of the parliament um they should be accountable to the parliament there ought to be you know mechanisms like super majorities or you know i mean this can be done through convention the the british have a tradition of you know with the public accounts committee for example that it will be an opposition mp history, traditionally who chairs the committee um and you know i i these things ought to be moved it's in it's in all of our interest for these things and the oversight of these things to be uh in a bipartisan space or or, or a non-partisan space um so i i i while there were some compromises in getting this legislation through finally i think that we will see this body and its oversight move in that in in that same direction that we've seen with the auditors general over time mm -hmm. So I guess hopefully we'll see those sorts of conventions adopted in the way that conventions of bipartisanship adopted. The question is whether there will be um, um, a need to actually sort of codify those conventions to make sure that that's, that's the way in which things operate. Yeah, Janet, well, when, did you have... when, when, when conventions don't work, you codify. <laughs> yeah. Janet, how soon do you predict we'll be codifying some of these conventions or... Oh, look, you would hope that some of the bipartisanship that's been shown in the development of, of this latest um, piece of legislation, um, the ironing out of some of the, um, the problems that seemed too difficult to overcome earlier on with earlier efforts, that some of that might continue. And we know from the experience in, in the states, in some of the states in particular, it doesn't take long for politicisation to, to set in. It doesn't take long for some of that warm and fuzziness um, to evaporate. Um, I, I would hope that we would see that continue for some time. But, you know, I completely agree with Gary that there needs to be a perception that this is th these are creatures of Parliament, they report to Parliament, um, that the, the role of the inspector is to help parliamentary committee oversight, because there is, there is absolutely a need for accountability for um, anti-corruption authorities. You know, again, we've seen issues and um, some of the states and territories where they've overstepped boundaries and that, that needs to be dealt with and needs to be brought in line. So there needs to be a mechanism. Uh, but there also needs to be that, that independence. So um, I'm an optimist, AJ. I hope that we'll see a, a little bit of a, um, a, a period of cooperation. And Cathy, as a, as, as a former parliamentarian, um, seeing this particular outcome in terms of your your perception of how well placed um the, the the parliament will be to exercise that role of oversight in the committee the commission on behalf of the community and and whether bipartisanship was you know how can bipartisanship in the in the oversight of the committee be be best reinforced how do you see it playing out mm. so i'm certainly with gary about much of what he said but i i have to say that the the last government was such a disappointment to me. And the stories that are coming out now about the prime minister and the Rabo debt and, you know, opening up of, you know, like we knew, I knew it wasn't good, but the lack of integrity around how much was going on and then the want to cover it up and the ability to cover it up um, has really shocked me, quite frankly. And I've lost a lot of the naivety I think I had. I hoped I had about how how people were doing things for the, the best intentions, lots of people. Because it seems to me that lots of people in the coalition knew what was going on and did nothing about it. So um, I, I was very, I, I followed that debate very closely when they were looking at the, the crossbench were moving those, those motions to increase the independence. And I was very, I mean, one didn't think that was gonna get up but I thought they made very good argument for it. And there were some excellent speeches during that. And I think those crossbenchers aren't going to forget that particular debate. They're going to remember it. Um, and some of those will be in parliament for, those people will be in parliament for quite a long time. 
So people like Bridget Archer and others, I think they're going to hold on to it quite uh, with great tenacity. So I, I think we will have another chance to have another look at that. I certainly hope so. Um, but it's not just the in independence. It's it's the other things that we're talking about. It's the ability for that for the whole legislation to become better. Um, there's obviously it's good, um, and there's a lot of room for improvement. And we are and we are playing catch up. This whole process is our Commonwealth government, our national level of government playing catch up to the states and learning where to put these sorts of integrity agencies. So. I think Gary alluded to the Auditor General um, um, as being another officer of the Parliament that that uh, has that recognised independence of the executive, um, and the Commonwealth is clearly catching up with learning how to try and sort out its integrity system so that it's got the agency that it needs, sort of serving the Parliament directly, recognised as being not being part of the executive of the day fulfilling a different constitutional purpose to other normal agencies. Clearly some of that debate landed in a spot that indicates that there's quite a bit of our parliament yet to catch up to the fact that these agencies, these core integrity agencies are different. They do have to play a different role. They do need different mechanisms to protect their independence in the long run because, um, because even if Janet may be an optimist, um, some of that reality of how politics works that you've just described, Cathy, means that that uh, you know if the agency is doing its job, it's going to be controversial. It's going to be um, upsetting some people, and it's going to need that independence to be able to protect itself and survive. So, interesting debates ahead. Um, so that brings us to one one other issue I wanted to touch on, and then we we do have some good questions. Um, which was some of what's been left out, I guess, of, of this whole model um, and what's left for the, you know, what's next on the integrity reform agenda, especially for our federal government. Because Cathy, you said, you know, you were after originally a integrity commission, um, not an anti-corruption commission, an integrity commission. You moved for parliamentary codes of conduct, um, infrastructure to support that, um, um, a, a strong integrity, uh, a strong corruption prevention function, some of which has found its way into the, still in the legislation, even though it's called an anti-corruption commission rather than a uh, an integrity commission, some of which will hopefully happen alongside of the anti-corruption commission and still happen just in other ways and other forms and through other initiatives. Um, but there is, um, there was another element to your integrity commission, which is which is not featured in, in uh, this model, which was to actually take the opportunity to create a whistleblower protection commissioner um, as being another huge gap in the, in the institutional system. Um, so that's something where the government has said that it will, and has indeed already has started moving in a small way on, on strengthening whistleblower protections and that it will examine and creating a whistleblower protection commissioner. Um, but I guess what, um, but, but clearly there was a, either an assumption that you didn't need it in this model or a, or a, a, a decision, you know, not to take this as an opportunity to, to, to make sure that that function was, was um, properly embedded in the way that our integrity system works as well. So, so Cathy, how do you see that issue playing out? How, how big an omission uh, from this package was was that a mission and how important is is it that that issue be attacked so i i've lost track a little bit of the current state of affairs with whistleblowers so maybe gary or janet might be able to update me but i just want to why it was so important for me is because i sat next to andrew wilkie <laughs> and i have to say there is so much in parliament like i gave that initial story about how with barnaby how i actually got involved to find out um, and then that that worked. But with with Andrew Wilkie, just hearing, listening to him and his experiences of um, his work with um, gambling and some of the corruption that he's been able to um, bring to light around um, Crown Casino and the Royal Commissions into gambling, like it is just been he would he would have a story a day about what was going on. So that was why it was so important to me to in, engage in, involve it in all of that things because of the the stories and the influence and the work that he had done. So I have actually um, lost track of where the government is at with whistleblowing, but it, it hasn't taken away the need for some really substantive work to be done there 
creative work. And um, Gary, I take the point that you will make before about those trip lines, you know, the mental health trip lines that um, I'd, I'd actually never seen it in that way before, but once you've explained it, it makes it clear. But how we actually need to be able to be re very clever in how we create a society that, that recognises the role, but also the risks of whistleblowers. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not au okay fait with it as I'm, I don't know where the government's at and I don't know where the legislation is at, but I, I really do believe Andrew would still be there um, advocating for it, but I haven't been speaking to him about it lately. Hmm. I mean, uh, I might just advertise that that also on the Transparency International Australia website, as well as our centre website, um, we've just published a, um, a an analysis of what the whistleblowing law reform priorities are um, that the government needs to attack and which ones they've, they've already confirmed that they will be uh, moving on initially as of last week, some initial reforms, but it's only a small fraction of of everything that needs to be done, including the ideal of, of having an independent agency that clearly has a responsibility to enforce, uh, but both to be a truly independent access point and clearing house for whistleblowers to be able to go to, but also to be able to follow through on protection and actually enforce protections uh, rather than f leaving um, whistleblowers to basically have to go to court to, to assert their own protections even though what they've done is basically just their job um, in in uh in reporting matters so we've actually had one question on this from cheryl um highlighting a point that you made um kathy about when you mentioned the robo debt scandal and the robo debt royal commission that's now underway pointing out that here we've already got examples of where there are public servants who who um um clearly challenged what was good disagreed with what was going on identify that there were integrity problems with it problems of lawfulness problems of ethics or whatever but there was no clearly no clear path for them to go be able to go to an independent agency to be able to raise those sorts of of um of um questions um um which is clearly part of the argument for having a stronger uh, whistleblower protection independent whistleblower protection agency um so um um so i think that that's uh an area that now is on the clearly on the agenda for um for the government to seriously consider and to, to make sure that those weak parts of the system uh will be fixed up because we can't expect uh people to come forward with information to the new national anti-corruption commission whether it's from the private sector or the public sector um, if if protections you know aren't both there on paper but also real and, and accessible in terms of of um of actually being able to secure that protection in practice rather than it just existing on paper for people to be able to assert try and assert in court if they happen to have enough money and enough legal firepower to do so um i don't know um gary and janet whether you wanted to comment on outstanding issues, gaps that, that are the next priority to fill, um, apart from a, either in support of or apart from a whistleblower protection commissioner. Um, but maybe maybe while you're while you're thinking about that, um, we do have one question from from a from a, uh, a good supporter and, and participant in our research, um, Peter Bennett, he won't he won't mind me saying who he is, uh, former president of Whistleblowers Australia, who actually points out that when it comes to public and private hearings that there's a good case gary you might want to respond to this there's a good case for um uh, that a whistleblower protection case for actually using private hearings to investigate as much as possible because then if whistleblowers need to give evidence they don't need to you know that evidence doesn't need to be brought forward in public their identity can be better protected their lives are less likely to be their lives are less, less likely to be disrupted by having to give evidence in in a public setting as opposed to a private setting, how do you see that role playing out in terms of how a commission like this should operate? Yeah, I mean, one of the things about the Royal Commission model is that it that there is um, the opportunity to challenge what is put forward, right? I mean, if a person is going to be accused, um, even you know, even even if it, even if it's not proceeding to criminal uh, to to a, to criminal charges immediately. Um, so clearly anyone who is substantially affected uh, by a particular matter 
uh, must have an opportunity to hear what's put to them and indeed have an opportunity to challenge uh, what what uh, you know what what is being what is being put. So I don't know how much of a protection um, see, uh, private hearings can be in 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 that in that regard. Um, you know, as I say, the Royal Commission model was to sort of while it was inquisitorial in nature, it did have a um, it did have a, a mechanism so that that um, you know people could be represented by counsel and. Uh, and indeed, the 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 the, the, the recent recently passed legislation has quite some quite good provisions on that. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure how much that that I mean. There are other ways. I think we've got to protect whistleblowers other than um, other than that one. Mm. And Gary, while you're on it, um, I mean, what's your view of of the significance of I mean, you know what are the other things that need to be done to protect whistleblowers or any other key gaps in the system that you? Well, look, the and government. The government, next. I think, will act. The, the government will act on whistleblowers, and I think it's it's incumbent on organisations like Transparency International and others to make sure that that is as robust as it can be made uh, as they work their way through it. And I think they will be sympathetic to that. That ought to be done early rather than later. Obviously, new governments have some some of the 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 vestiges of opposite of being in opposition is still hanging around them, and so they're more sympathetic. Look, I think I think Kathy's point about integrity is an important one here, but I've been making, as you know, AJ, I've been making the very strong point that I think um, the the integrity stream ought to be separated from a corruption stream. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of integrity issues that we need to talk about and deal with beyond things that are corrupt, and the media will always conf conflate. If, if the two things are in the same basket, then, then a breach of integrity or a want of integrity is a going, to, going to get labelled as corrupt. And, and if we are going to have robust conversations about things where values are still evolving and we still need to have a conversation about where the boundary between right and wrong lies, then we need, I think we need to step that into a different space and have permission to talk about issues that go to integrity that are not necessarily corrupt. Hmm. Well, I think that brings us to a, a, a final question, which I'll put to Janet about corruption prevention and about the integrity building functions of, of the commission. Um, uh, and then, uh, then, I'll, then I'll be asking Deborah to give us some very brief um, closing remarks, probably briefer than we planned for, unfortunately. Um, um, and, but Janet, there's been a couple of really good questions about the prevention side. Um, a question that says that prevention should also include explicitly um, partnering with universities and civil society and others to do research, which doesn't get a specific mention in the legislation, but, but also things like, as some countries have done, devising measures to, that help keeping the crooks out of running public institutions, um, or also and also a question about, you know, do we think the new body will influence regulatory design to minimise the scope for corruption developing in future spending or licensing regimes, for example, or grants systems or whatever, a question from Daniel. So how do the, um, how, I mean, are those things that, uh, that uh, this prevent, prevention integrity building function of the commission needs to include? Oh, absolutely. And I think those are those are really great questions and comments. And this is why it's so important to see how this body proceeds, how the implementation um, plays out, because the frameworks are quite good in terms of prevention. There is, there is scope there. It will depend on the people who are involved. It will depend on the resources and it will depend on the approach and methodologies that they adopt. I mean, certainly they should absolutely be partnering with anybody who's got any expertise, any ideas to offer, because that will be um, a good way to um, control the use of their own resources. Um, and certainly in an ideal um, framework, you would be looking at regulation. Um, I, I've mentioned that um, here and, and elsewhere, that there's a lot to learn from how regulation can be used to control conduct and, and to prevent um, um, offending from or corruption or integrity breaches, however we want to frame it, from happening in the first place, alongside education, and education would be part of a good regulatory, responsive regulatory framework. So there is scope for all of those things. But you know, we, when legislation is drafted, the drafters of the legislation, the, the legal framework that uh, many 
of those drafters are operating from assumes that these things will just happen. We've put the we've put the bones in place. What's the problem now? It's um, it's all going to happen, but that's not the case. You know, we've had regulation against crime for thousands of years. It hasn't stopped crime. Uh, we've had regulation um, against and laws against all sorts of things that don't stop that behaviour. What we need is a focus on what's effective, what will work, um, and and to work with people who have some expertise in those areas. So, and and also those comments that have been made in the questions. Mm. Thanks, Janet. So I think we are right up against time. So I would love to um, just turn to Deborah, Deborah Stokes from Transparency International Australia, just to give us a little bit of a summing up and a reflection on uh, on this moment of history that we've been talking about with the creation of the Commission um, and uh, and the path forward from here. Thank you very much, AJ. As uh, a board member of Transparency International Australia, which has pressed for a National uh, Integrity Commission for a very long time, I'm very pleased to be part of this, this panel today, to conclude this panel today, uh, and which has talked about this historic development. I wish to thank our very knowledgeable speakers, uh, all of whom have played in some way or fashion uh, a role in the long and winding history of Australia's anti-corruption commissions. Your insights, I must say, have been uh, very, very impressive, and I'm sure the audience has uh, benefited a lot from listening, listening to you today. Um, we heard about many of the positive features of the legislation, but we also heard about uh, some of the shortcomings um, and loopholes. And uh, we heard that, um, that we'll need to be vigilant uh, as the commission is uh, set up and as it takes forward its, its work. Uh, so there will be an ongoing role uh, for, for all of us, for the public, for, for parliamentarians, uh, civil society and media uh, in, in uh, carrying out that role. Um, we also heard that we need to significantly upgrade our whistleblower protection laws. Um, and so that will also be an area of uh, ongoing vigilance for, for many of us. Early on in the presentation, AJ mentioned Australia's significant slide in Transparency International's corruption, Australia's standing in the Corruption Perceptions Index. And uh, so, you know, how can we reverse that, that slide? And from our perspective, the National Anti-Corruption Commission is an essential step, uh, an essential uh, first step, um, but it's not going to be sufficient and uh, much more needs to be done to restore uh, citizens' trust in government in Australia. Uh, and uh, for example, um, the implementation of a, of a robust code of conduct for politicians, we need uh, limits on election advertising, we need uh, robust rules on lobbyists and rules about post-parliamentarian employment. Um, we also need urgent action on Australia's systems for countering money laundering and also our systems for registering beneficial ownership of uh, companies and uh, like entities. We need to bring those systems up to international standards. We have really fallen behind. Uh, and um, all of this uh, suggests to us uh, that we need a national integrity plan that brings all of these things together uh, with, with a view of restoring um, uh, our standing, not only in transparency in the international uh, CPR, but also uh, to restore and build greater integrity in the systems around us along the lines that uh, Cathy McGowan was talking about. And as I mentioned, the role of civil society organisations, journalists, academics, think tanks will continue to be very vital and as will be the vital role of courageous people 
like, um, and politicians like Cathy McGowan and uh, wish to pay particular tribute to her role uh, and, and the role of, of those who are following in her footsteps. So thank you very much. But a, a great panel and many insights. Really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Deborah. So I think we better leave the conversation there. Um, and uh, we've gone a little bit over time. Um, but, uh, but I fully agree that that's a, um, been a fantastic discussion of a whole range of really important issues in the design of this commission, but also the ones that we're, that we're looking out for as we move forward into the future with its implementation. So if I can thank everybody for joining us, and especially um, I know that you'll join me in a big virtual round of applause, um, thanking Cathy McGowan, Gary Sturgis, uh, Janet Ransley and Deborah Stokes for, uh, for participating in the discussion today. Um, we hope that you'll follow, continue to follow activities of the Centre for Governance and Public Policy, but also Transparency International Australia in the future as we continue to move forward on, on all of these issues. So a huge thank you to all our panellists and to everybody who's participated today for asking a range of really, really good questions. And uh, we'll sign off now, but, but uh, hope that you'll join us again in the future. So thank you very much.